Hello. Hello. Nicole. Nice, nice to meet, meet you, David. You too. Antoinette. <laughs> Hi there. It's been too long. It has. It has. I just got home from New York helping my mom with yeah. her house because she, she's selling her house. I just, <laughs> <laughs> the most difficult job I have ever had. Right. Our relationship though is so strong. It's stronger <laughs> now than it was. So I tell you. that's the best part. How are you? How are you doing? I'm okay. I'm okay. I, um, I'm actually hanging out with my mom um, in Northern California. Oh, well, how nice. How often do you have a chance to visit her? For the last year and two months. <laughs> I'm living here now. So, um, yeah, because, you know, the pandemic and, uh, and I can work from home, so... So it's good. And uh, she's having her birthday next month. So she says, don't tell anybody my age. So I can't do that anymore. No worries. No worries. I will not ask. She's <laughs> not older. She's younger, David. Remember that. She's always younger. Yes. Yes. Uh, with you, now, I, I want to say, how do you, you go by Antoinette Abamante? Yes. Honestly, you can even use my sign name, which looks like that off the chin. You could just call me Antoinette. Either works. I was thinking that, you know. Yeah, Ab Abamante is my father's name. It comes from his side of the family. So I like to honor that. Right. Antoinette's just me. I was thinking that earlier too. I said, something's telling me just Antoinette, sort of like Cher, Madonna, Antoinette. There you go. There you go. Keep it simple. Keep, that's that much better. I love it. And we have the wonderful interpreter today. Pleasure meeting you, Nicole Pacino. Pancino? Yes, Pancino. Pancino. Wonderful. Well. And Antoinette's saying she's amazing. People are always saying that we have just this bond when she's able to interpret for me I hear that from a lot of people so well I tell you you know to finally meet you Nicole here your energy is so I could see why the two of you work together so well because you're both so loving and giving and your energy is like absolutely absolutely you are so right David so Long, we've known each other for over a decade or more. What is it? I don't know when we first met. Yeah, it's definitely more than a decade. I'm going to say 16 years, maybe even 17. I would say that too. I would say that too. Yeah, because I remember getting involved with you in your workshops and I will never forget. I learned so much working with your group. It was, it taught me to become a stronger person. Really? Well, I, you know, I have to say that you have always, I mean, your acting always blows me away. Your creative, oh, how do I put this? Your creative energy, your creative art, um, your being real and in the moment always like took my breath away. So thank you for that. Oh, I am so touched, David. Thank you. That means a lot to me. When someone else sees that, it, it really does. Yeah. Now, beside being an actress, you know, I, I was I was reading through your bio and and so many things. You have your own production company. Is that true? I do. I do. And <laughs> it has been a lot of work, let me tell you. Right. Right. Now you named it Mermaid. Is that it? The 
mermaid signature. Yes, that is correct. Yes. Um, I'd always, for years, even before I wrote the book, Tree Wise, Signing Branches, that's the book I wrote. And for the logo, I wanted a mermaid. So, and I, and the reason why I even chose that is I just picture myself as a person who's in the water. And honestly, I could never see enough whales. I am such a whale fanatic. Whales are my animals. And so to keep the earth communicating from top to bottom, that whole idea, that mentality, I, I'm so entranced by it. It is so powerful. It is very powerful. And so whales are it for me. So yeah. I'm like, I'm thinking about when you get in the water and how you have the whale there and in the water, you don't hear anything, right? Everyone's deaf, right? In the water. So I thought that was perfect. I thought that way everyone's equal. So that's why I chose that name. I really, I've always loved being near the water. My son, who's now 20, who's studying to become a marine biologist. Ah! Right for me. I am all for him doing that. You know, I'm like whales, keep going with it. Right. So he's an animal person too. It's so interesting how, you know, I've really been connecting lately to hummingbirds. Um, it just feels like family coming to visit, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I do. I absolutely do. I always see hummingbirds and to me, it's, it's someone's lucky. There's some luck that's coming towards me. That's how I always feel when I see hummingbirds. So it's great that you have that connection with them. Mm. That's awesome. A couple of things just went through my mind. The, just connecting to this, it brought me to the word proud. What are you most proud of in your life? Oh, wow. Being a wonderful daughter, being a good person, being a heartfelt person, being a wonderful mom for my kids, a partner. I just want to be a good person. That's what I want. It's very simple, I will admit, but that's what I want. I tell you, it's, it, we need more of that in this world. I, you know, with all the craziness going on, the more of us who are about the heart, about love, um, that's, that's what counts. Maybe that's why we all connect so well. Absolutely. I think so. I could not agree more. It's, we need more people like this in the world. Absolutely. I very much believe that when I'm a good person, good people will be attracted to me. Like you and like Nicole. Good people will come if you are a good person. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. Now, you mentioned uh, just a couple of minutes ago about your book. Um, now, you've written several books, correct? Well, I wrote three books so far. One that's still on my shelf, gathering dust at the moment, <laughs> but two that have been published. The first is Tree Wise, Signing Branches. And that one was really written for my son when I was having that relationship with my son when he was four. And he's hearing, but I come from a family where everyone was deaf. I later married a hearing man. So I call them hearing people, right? And so I was used to my life as a person in a deaf family to be a deaf person in a hearing family. That was a whole new experience for me. And I would see my son when he was four years old and I sent him to preschool, I saw him communicating with other people. But whenever he looked at me, he'd use sign language. He wouldn't talk at all. And other people, other children, even adults, teachers, parents would always look at us and but he felt, huh, look at this, there's a difference. So people started asking him, hey, is your mom deaf when I wasn't there? And so I went, oh, okay, this is something that's happening. So there was one day I was just sitting in my office 
And my son came up to me and he goes, mom, why is it that you and I are different than all those other parents and kids? Why are you different? What's your mom? You're not like the other moms out there. And I just about swallowed my heart. And I said, you know what? And I, I'll never forget this. I said, I love you no matter what. And I grabbed him and held him so tightly. And while I'm thinking about this and I, I had a tear going down my cheek, I'm like, what do I do? Do I get angry? And I said, you know what, Antoinette, what's really important is that you're here in the moment, hugging your son. And I thought, how can I teach others? You know what? I can write a book. And at that time we were reading books together a lot. You know, I would have a book open and I would sign it to him. You know, he was four years old and that's when it hit me. I could write a book to teach them about how to live with deaf people, right? So that's eventually why I wrote that book was because of my son. Wow. I love that. You know, it reminds me of, um, it reminds me so much of the movie I saw the other night, which is nominated all over the place, Coda. And, and your yeah. story is of course different, but it's just to hear, to hear that story and to see, see everything. It's really, it, it, thank God, it seems like Hollywood is starting to open its doors. Yes. Yeah, to be able to have that kind of access, it's going to be coming more and more. And I really want to see people learn uh, from different stories, not one story for everyone, but to really realize the diverse stories that exist out there. We live in all of our different families or groups or whatever you have. We all live our own unique ways. There is no one cookie cutter version of any story. It's true. And we need to share more stories. Yes. Yes. People seem to put everybody in boxes uh, or, oh, if you're this way, okay, this, or, or you're the, and especially, I mean, I have many different friends in the deaf community, but I know that there's so many different levels of that as well, because different hearing and this and that. So uh, so like you said, there's so many different kinds of stories. You're absolutely right. There are some people that come from deaf families. There's some people who are the only deaf person in a hearing family. And those lived experiences can be very different. For me, I had deaf parents, so I could see what it meant to be a deaf person from the word go, right? Mm -hmm. I developed that identity. For those people who are born into hearing families, they go, huh, I'm different than everyone else in my family. So that's what I applied to my kids when I was working with them. And I'm like, oh, they're hearing. They're very different than the experiences I had as a deaf child. I mean, I love both, of course, though. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, now I'm, I'm fascinated. You, you said you have, you have three books, but one's on the shelf. What's the other book? That's a gratitude book. Yes, it's I'm trying to think of how to say this. It's more written like a journal where I'm really learning about myself. So many things that happened in my life, so many obstacles that I've had to overcome. And so that's an example and it's done in sign. I actually hired an illustrator who's also deaf who was able to do the drawings of me signing for that book. And the very last page, I think maybe the last two or three pages, that's for the reader to write about themselves, about what they've learned from the book, what they've learned about themselves. And it's about overcoming fear. I mean, how to eat the best food, how to live while so much chaos exists around us, how to survive and navigate the world. It's about all of those. It's really about gratitude, being thankful for what we have and just live as simple as you can. That's the point. 
And I have to tell you, that was honestly for me, it was a learning process for me at, while I was writing that. And I wanted other people to have that same experience. And it worked. It worked for me. It was fantastic. And so when I wrote that, you know, I wanted to share it with the world. Oh, my gosh. I, it, it, it's so perfect to come from yourself and, and have people connect that way. Is it called Gratitude? What is the title of it? Gratitude. That is the name of it. Stunning. Yeah. Can I, can I find out a little about the book on the shelf or is that sort of a surprise for later? Let me see. Um, I could tell you a little bit about it. Okay. My triangle vacation. And the reason I say that is I married my husband, Scott, and he had two children from a previous marriage. Mm -hmm. Then I welcomed them into our family. We all lived together, a blended family as it's called. And I was like, okay, wow. So they have their mother who, we have a very good relationship with her, but those rules were different than the rules in our house. And so we had to kind of navigate how to explain that. So once I had my two boys and those other two boys from the previous marriage, the four of them together, we saw the four of them really bonding. They didn't want to be separated at all. So that's what helped me write this book about when we'd go out on vacations and we would invite, of course, my stepsons too, to figure out how to work together and bond together. And sometimes we would say such and such, and then we'd hear, that's not what my mom says. I'm like, okay, well, this is your mom's home and her rules and that's perfectly okay and we respect those so I'm I'm not really your friend your mom I'm more your friend so I support that but it was not easy to navigate it was a huge challenge for me but at the same time when I was writing that book I thought well I want to make sure I can support other blended families so and I'm not sure why it is I shelved that for a little while um, and I wrote the gratitude book in the meantime I love it. Well, it sounds like it could be a good movie coming up in the future. (laughs) You know something, David? You got something there. I'm (laughs) filing that away. Well, sometimes I got something there. Other days, it's like, where did I leave my brain? (laughs) Write it down. That's your best friend. Write it down. I'm going to throw out a word and whatever comes to your mind. Eternals. Yeah. Um, I worked with the family and I felt like I really brought my whole self, my personal culture, my deaf culture. I brought all of that to this family and gave them some ideas of how you could see a deaf person leading like myself. I felt like, you know, I'm a leader in both worlds, both the deaf world and the hearing world, wherever. That's just kind of who I am. That's my personality. So I shared a lot and I was so happy to see the story that came out. I am so glad that they were able to cast another deaf actress that was phonetic phenomenal. I'm very happy that all that happened. I am not in any way against that, but I do feel like they didn't really see me as an important person as well. It never really giving me the credit or paid me more to really honor and recognize my idea of showing the world that I am important too. That's the one thing that I still feel a little bit but I know my next movie, I can bring everything to. And I've learned not to share a lot of information. I, that was a lesson that I learned from that experience. So I decided to go, I'm not gonna perseverate on the negative. I'm gonna look at the positive. I'm gonna be a professional. I'm going to wait until everything's ready to go before I share any information about it. 
And that would be your advice to the writers, the students, the creators out there. Don't share too much your ideas because others can possibly take them. Exactly. And negotiate. Make sure that is on the table before you share any story ideas. Negotiate if another person wants something, you need to have their name on a piece of paper that they've signed so that you do get credit at the same time. So everything needs to be on the table. Right. Everything in writing, too. I heard a lot of people do it verbally, and that doesn't necessarily count. Yeah, no. You have to have an attorney to work with you. I had to do that myself. I had to hire an attorney, which, yeah, I. everything is about money, too. And I have saved money for that, specifically. Right. And then when we had investors come on board who believed in us, that was the support we needed. Mm. It was a blessing for us. It really was. So tell me about since August. Yes. Yeah. <sighs> very profound story. A very heavy story. I tend to be attracted to those heavy stories. I find them fascinating. Yeah. It's about life. And that story is about forgiveness and how to forgive. Something happens to my character and the character's son. Mm. But at the same time, the character learns so much more about themselves, about forgiving, how to process pain. It's really, it's an onion with those multiple layers. And the more you go down, the more you find, do you really find your core of yourself? And you realize whatever you see around you, it still comes back to being about you. That story has taught me about what you need to value life and what it means to value life. And I hope anybody who watches that movie learns that same lesson for themselves to forgive. And when I say forgive, it's a challenge because there can sometimes be really terrible things. It's very hard to forgive and you want to hold on to that anger, but forgiveness is a gift for the person who gives it. And it's not about the other person you're forgiving, it's about yourself. And whether that person accepts your forgiveness or not, it doesn't matter because once you offer it wholeheartedly, you can move on with your life. And, the diff and there's lots of layers to that. So to me, that's what that story is about. about. I don't wanna give away too much of the story. No, no, no. Well, now, where can we see this? Where can somebody go and, and see this film? 2021 was when it was sent out to several film festivals. The filmmaker, Diana and I, actually did do a tour. We met several people. Wonderful experience for us. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, now, Diane and I, have, are talking we know that there is one buyer who's interested but we haven't we've decided not to work with that buyer we'd rather wait yeah. so currently yeah. we do have a few people who are interested in buying the film so we'll kind of have to see how it goes but we definitely have our fingers crossed but it will be out there sooner than later we hope good good i'm i look forward to seeing it i look forward to seeing it um i know you won some awards on that too I did. I absolutely did. Best picture. I know that film won. Yes, in New York at the Winter Awards Festival. That's an international film festival. It was a wonderful experience and it was so great to be back in New York. Oh, I bet. I miss New York. I miss it. Yeah. Listen, yeah. I, you know, I mean, oh, my mom's going to be moving here, so I won't have any place to go back in New York. She is? Well, that'll be great. You'll be close. Yes, that's why I was helping her to sell her house, and she's going to be coming here to a new home. Not, not too far from me, in fact. 
So my family, she'll be near the grandchildren. Mm. Mm. I, that'll be great. It's nice to have family, especially at this time. It's, life has really seemed to change a bit and we have to find the positive. We have to keep going after that positive. Um, it's, it is a new normal. And by the way, that was one of the, the, the TV shows that you were in. I, let me list just a few of them. The New Normal, Switched at Birth, Raising Hope, Curb Your Enthusiasm. I loved watching that clip, by the way, the other day at the wedding. Oh, my God. <laughs> Do you have a certain experience with um, that pops into your mind right now of being on one of those sets that you go, ah, this was this is why I love acting. Yes, let me think. What comes to mind for those TV shows is how fast-paced they are. It is so different than film work. And it's so different from stage work. It's its its own animal, completely different cultures in any one of those. So TV, definitely very fast-paced. And we got the script written real fast and you have to read it really fast and everything's moving. They, we have that cold read, right? That we have to go through. Right. And I learned that I really, how do I want to say this? I enjoyed being more involved, absolutely. And I felt like I really enjoyed with films, you know, cause I, I've been to school, I've studied, I've been training for many years. And when it comes to stage and film, there's a similarity that exists between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And I really like it when I have that full meaty script in front of me that's finished that I can really read and I can really get to the bones of it and really develop the characters. And just sometimes I'll read it back to front. I like to have that whole thing to, at my disposal to really develop my character. That's my thing. And that's why I tend to drift more towards film work. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Not that I didn't enjoy TV. I absolutely enjoyed working TV too. It's just such a different experience. And I learned a lot from when I was working there and, and just how fast paced everything was. So it was interesting to me. I liked it, it was different, but I think if I had to pick one, I like having that full meaty script that's completed that I can really work through. Yeah. And yeah. really develop the characters and really swim in that world. And think about why each line was said. Why is this character saying this? Why did they choose to express themselves that way? What do they want from the other person? Really dig in to the substance of the whole thing, the whole story. That's that's really what I love doing. What is your biggest dream in life? Oh, who? I think when I get an award, maybe, maybe not, but if I were to win an award, I would love to give it to my mom, have my mom come up on stage with me and say, mom, you are why I am who I am. I'm tearing up just thinking about it. I'd say that's my biggest goal. And the reason I think about my mom like this is she was born and raised in Italy. She had had no schooling because she grew up in a very small town. She became a farmer and she went to a school with hearing students, but she said, I don't like this, it was too frustrating. So my grandparents decided to take her with them and work on the farm. Yeah. And when I look at my mother now, I am so impressed in this woman who never went to school and see how much she has accomplished. She manages everything with me, my brother, my dad. My dad both work uh, making clothes in New York City. And that's why I am so into clothes and materials and fabric and all that. I, I like to know the good quality. I learned that from my parents growing up. And when I look at my mom and see how hard she has worked to take care of a house, we had renters that lived upstairs, tenants 
who she would make sure she managed everyone. She had wills and lawyers. She managed a household and she didn't have interpreters back then. She was able to figure out how to do this on her own. Exactly the opposite of what happened in that movie, Coda. Exactly the opposite. And I look at my mom and I just, I am so in awe of her. Seeing my mother as the most intelligent person in the world and to realize she'd had no schooling. She figured out how to come to the United States. She moved here when she was 22 years old. She had me, she had my brother and she made it work. She knew that school was important. She made sure we went. And I remember asking her why she made us go if she didn't have to go. And she said, no, you have to do it. So one time I went to Coney Island. They would, we lived near the, near the beach. And she used to take us all the time to Coney Island. And I think I was 11 at the time. And my mom was saying, come on, let's go swimming. And I kept saying, I don't want to go swimming, mom. I would just want to stand here like you. And my mom said, oh, no, no, you do not be like me. Let's go together. And I just really fought her. I said, no, you can't swim. So I can't swim either. And my mom grabbed me by the hands and said, let's go swimming. I learned how to swim from her. She did not know how to swim, David. And I'm like, what's that? But that's her. She taught me anything is possible. You can accomplish anything in the world. And I very much believe that. That's why I am who I am today, why I've created my own business, why I make films. All of that is because of her. She made me do everything. So in my work, I've, I've become a supervisor and I've had to work with several people under people, over people, there's so much to manage. And I go, this is what my mom taught me. She taught me, do not be afraid of the big world. Do not be afraid of the hearing world. You need a job, Antoinette. That's how you survive. And to learn that from a deaf person who never had a day of schooling, I just, I could not be in more awe of her. Several things came to my mind. Number one, I'm watching you and I'm just like, entranced by you and I was thinking when are you writing a one-woman show <laughs> I mean when are you gonna have a one I'm just like I could just sit here and take you in have you thought of doing that have you done that I've thought about it I've thought about it I have one um but I decided not to do it right you know okay. I have a script also on the shelf, also gathering dust. <laughs> I could see if maybe it could come back to life again. We'll see. Yeah, you could add some new stuff to it. Um, the other thing is too, what what sign are you? I know that's like, uh, you know, <laughs> but because I so relate to the love that you have for your mother. Um, I, I'm an Aquarius. I'm a Gemini. Oh, okay. Yeah, the twins. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. So I want to, I, I was again reading more about you. You know, it's interesting. You know somebody maybe for <laughs> 15 to 20 years, and then you find out you went to ACT and you were what? One of the, you were the first deaf student there, deaf actress? I was. That was in 99, 1999, when I first got to San Francisco, because I was living in San Francisco. How long did and you live there? San Francisco is there three and a half years. I loved it there. The people are so cool and there's such diversity. I really liked it, just like New York, different cultures, of course, but all those different foods and the Mission District, oh, with all of those foods, I, that was my second home. I was there all the time, but yeah, so for ACT, I took some classes like Shakespeare, and I had two interpreters, and I remember one that really knew Shakespeare very well, was experienced in Shakespeare. The other one was able to interpret into ASL, but to really figure out the English, because, you know, Shakespeare is its own thing. Mm -hmm. So to try and get the ASL and the Shakespeare together, I, I felt like every actor 
should take a Shakespeare class. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Um, scene study. And then a year later, the director of the program came up to me and said, hey, have you considered teaching? Because we were able to get some money for a deaf cohort. And I'm like, sure, absolutely. So I went out and advertised at the Fremont School for the Deaf and I went and gave presentations to them. And there were some people, gosh, I'm trying to think, it was more than 10, maybe a dozen, 13 students who came and they paid for them. They invested in that, they were able to get funding. And so we did a lot of hard work on that. Gosh, two years, I think it was. And I enjoyed it so much. It was a fantastic experience working there. Oh, I love, I love ACT. I mean, I grew up in the Bay Area and San, I lived in San Francisco. And it's just, when you said that, I, I related to that because I went to their summer Congress, which was, I guess at that time, it was 10 weeks, 18 classes a week, intensive nine to five, Monday through Friday. Um, so it was pretty amazing. So... I, that's wonderful. I went in, did I go in 95? No, 91. 91 is when I went. Really? We just missed each other. I know, right? I don't know. I just, yeah. Hey. It was a great living there. It was just great. Well, beside, I mean, you're all over the place. New York, San Francisco. And I love the Castro. <sighs> That area was the bomb. It was the best. Play all night. <laughs> exactly. And the Castro Theater. You know they were going to shut that down or sell it? Thank God I heard they aren't doing that. So I, let's pray that they don't do that. That's a landmark. How can they? Anyway. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Cool I, town. Oh, my God. Yeah, I saw Lily Tomlin do her one woman show at the Castro Theater years ago. It was it was so much fun. Talking about theater, I mean, okay, so you do TV, you do film, you 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 write, you you I mean, you do so much stuff and then in connection to acting, you were in the national touring company of Children of a Lesser God. How was that experience? Yes, yeah. Um, it was my first experience being on tour with a group like that. Mm. And it was so cool. I learned so much living with, there was like five of us, I remember, who would rent houses from place to place to place. Sometimes we'd be in hotels. We would have to drive ourselves and we'd each take a turn make sure that we took turns cleaning. I mean, it was teamwork. We fought, we were close, we bonded, all of these people. And we had two people who were hearing and most of the time they would do voiceovers for the deaf, three deaf actors. So we mm -hmm. all worked together. We did a main stage tour and we also, we were able to get some money from the government as well. We got some funding. And so we did a residential program where we would stop by schools, schools for the deaf, and we would stay there for a while to try and develop a theater within each of these schools that we stayed at to try and train them. We would reach out to other schools, people in the community. Most of those were hearing people. And so they would become the voiceover actors for the, for the kids in the schools for the deaf. I, I so enjoy it when I see deaf people and hearing people working together, you know, cause at first it'll be a little bit scary, right? This is very different, but once you really get together and bridge that it, people just learn how much they love each other. They love learning sign language. So for me, that's what I love best. I think it's just phenomenal. Those memories I have are just so special to me. I love that. I think that that was absolutely perfect training for all of us to become actors, to be professional actors. That was the perfect way to go through it. That time couldn't have been better. I'm, I'm watching you and hearing you uh, 
and and taking you in and again i go back to the performance artist that you are you're and the way you write is the way you speak in a way because I, I, I need to continue to learn. I know a few signs in sign language and I've been talking about it for years that I have to really study and study and learn this. But I watch you and the way, you know, it's not everybody is like this, but I watch how you move your hands with the emotion and, and uh, it's, it's again mesmerizing the way you perform and it comes from a real place. You could see, you know, you're welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah. I just- oh, that touches my heart, it really does. And how I learned is I went to schools, right, about acting and they didn't have much for many deaf schools for actors, right? Mm. They would have interpreters there and so what I did is I'm like, okay, so I want to become an actor. I enjoy the craft, right? The artistry that's involved with it. And I thought, how can I do this? I need to find a way. So I would teach students certain signs, like do me a favor um, and maybe I'll teach you some signs and you can help me out with these acting classes or whatever. So I would try to read people's lips and do the signs I could, but really I wanted to make sure I learned how to perform. So I would really watch that and I would see how the teachers would teach for those actors who are hearing, right? Mm. What they need to do with their voice, how you could play with your intonation, how you can change things around. You can make yourself sound older. You could sound more masculine, more feminine. So I remember seeing that and how they made those adjustments. And I thought I can apply this to my hands. So a person changes their vocal intonation and they just change the voice to sound more masculine, more feminine. It's all in my hands. I make them heavier when I'm producing sign language, yeah. right? Yeah. Or I make them lighter, a little bit more formal, a little bit more proper. It's all in my hands and I can play with my hands just the way hearing actors play with their voice. That's where I really learned how to delineate and figure out how to really get to the bones of something how you can make that change to make it work for the different characters. And that was just something innate in me that I just found within myself. And just, it's all about getting in there and playing. I'm ready to play. <laughs> Let's do, let's oh do, we will. You know, you are, uh, again, I could add to your list of, you know, mother, actress, you know, but at, of course, you're a, a major advocate. You, you work with Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA and Women in Film. What, what was your involvement in, in these? I wanted to see deaf and disabled people really involved in the larger world, not as their own little separate area off to the side in their own little pockets. I don't want that. I want to see us all working together as a cohesive group and communicating because every person has something. It doesn't matter what you do. And that's why I really believe in being supportive in advocacy. My father has epilepsy. And it can be very severe for him as, and he's deaf as well. And so he stopped working at a younger age than he would have normally. And I grew up seeing my father and I remember being scared because they would be very severe. It's not like a little minor thing where he'd kind of close his eyes. He would have just a huge seizure things would break around him because his body would move and he would come out of it and he'd be tired and unfamiliar with what had happened. And so as a, as a little girl, that scared me growing up. And one day I realized my father had fallen down and I'd gone to the store to get some bread, I think some Italian bread or something like that. And as I brought it home, I saw this huge crowd of people watching my father gathered around him. Um, because some people come over to visit. And I knew instinctively that that was my dad. 
And I honestly felt embarrassed that there was just a circle around him watching him. And I thought, okay, I have to do something. And there were a couple of police officers there as well, trying to hold my father as he's writhing. And I said, this is the time for me to understand and accept that this is what my father had. So I walked into that circle and I said, everyone, this is my dad. Help me out, right? Don't just stand there staring, right? Because there's my home. My home is right there. So the two police officers were kind of holding on to him, carried him to our house. And I remember when I touched him, I felt like my dad for the first time when he became sick and was having those seizures, I, I swear that just transferred right up my arm and it came from love. That idea of acceptance of this is who my dad is. I hadn't done that as a child, you know, and my mom had always been the one to take care of him. She'd say, oh, go back to your bedroom, Antoinette. And I was happy to do that because I was so intimidated by everything. But in that moment, it really hit me and it opened my mind and it opened my heart. Everyone has a life story, every single person. And my father is an amazing person. He is beautiful with sign language. Everything I have in sign language, I learned from him. I just, I love my dad. He passed away 18 years ago now, but I will never, ever forget my father. I'm a daddy's girl. So that's where I learned. You have to love everyone, no matter what. Everyone is special. Mm. What is your biggest victory in life? I can think of three cases that I won and I'm sure we won them. We worked together. One was for a museum, actually two museums. I'm trying to think LA Science Museum and Century Museum, those two museums that are near here and Santa Ana. Neither of them had captions, closed captioning for like the IMAX or anything like that. And I reached out to them and say, you know, you really should have captioning in your films, but they would not listen. I reached out to them again. I said, you know, please, we've become members. We want to bring our children here. We want to be involved with our children's lives. I mean, they're hearing, but I want to be able to come home and talk about what was said and what we saw and talk about what's happening in the museum. I want to have that conversation at home. And they blew me off again. So I was able to find a pro bono attorney who worked really hard and we were able to win those cases, including the Discovery Museum. I went and saw this little boy, this little deaf boy, who's in a program with a lot of hearing classmates. And he went into this particular movie that I had just walked out of that had no captions. And it hit me. I said, I have to do the same thing again. I reached out to the attorney again. We filed another suit and won that one. And then of course, movie theaters that didn't have any captions, we were able to get that provided as well. So the cases that I've won, there's more to come. I am still working on right now on a new case that's currently being developed. But that's the only way because you have to teach people and talking to them, I was ignored constantly, you know, but without that lawsuit to really be the stick that they need to have to really make systemic change. And it takes so much more work. I wish I had more people around me so we could all work together as a team on that. Someday it'll happen. Yeah, yes, it will. Um, oh, by the way, I saw Diana was with Jordan today and she sends her love. Oh, yes. Oh, please send her love back. My love back to her. I haven't seen her for so long. How is she doing? I'm she's sure she's good. doing she's, uh, she's being honored this, this next week herself um, uh, at an event. So it's, it's great to see how people that you love and respect in the community uh, and the artist community, the, the, the community that, that just, you know, I, that, that's what I love. I love to see people succeed. Um, Absolutely. 
would you email me and let me know what's going on with her? Yes. Yes. In fact, I'll post on your Facebook too. Yeah. Yeah. And in social media, I don't check as much. So yeah, Facebook text me. That would be fantastic. Okay. Okay. I have one, one final question to ask. What do you want the most at this moment in your life? Hmm. Happiness. <laughs> Can I say that? Yeah. Yeah, happiness. That's it. Um, I want to see more success for all of us. It's important to, you know, take it one day at a time to focus on ourselves. And that just manifests in the rest of the world.